right. That leads us to number nine on our agenda tonight, the superintendent's report. Dr. Ross. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board and our community. It is an honor to um, really just see the, the fruits of when a teacher ignites a student. Uh, Avery serves on our uh, student advisory, and so uh, we get to meet with our students and uh, see just her leadership potential grow. Uh, but also just uh, the, the wonderful impact that teachers make each and every day to transform the lives of our children. That's what it's all about. So uh, salute to Mr. Chapman as well. And it's just always great when you see those Skills USA jackets. Uh, uh, that's very distinct. But to have that honor, not only for the state of South Carolina, but for District 5, uh, that is amazing. And I said the best thing that you can do for a child. Number one thing you can do for a child is put a highly qualified teacher in front of them, a transformation expert, uh, as we saw with Mr. Chapman here. The second best thing is support that, that high functioning teacher, that high quality teacher with a great principal. October is Principals Month, National Principals Month, so we pause uh, uh, to really thank a principal. We have 23 in our district uh, that uh, work very hard. We have an amazing uh, principal staff and our assistant principals. Uh, we are very proud of each of them uh, as they work to support our teachers uh, to ensure that every student feels loved in our schools and every student has uh, the ability to grow in our schools. And so we're a system uh, ask, asking three critical questions each day. Why do we do this work? How do we accomplish that why and then what are our outcomes? Our why is that we love and grow our students our how is that we're focused on academic, social, emotional growth and development. And then our what are our strategic plan outcomes, 24 strategies that are chasing four performance goals to ensure that every child feels loved in our schools and every child has demonstrated academic growth in our schools. Uh, as you are aware, the state also has a strategic plan. Uh, by 2030, 75% of students being at or above grade level. Uh, we want our students, uh, just as the state does, to be college, career, military, and life ready. Uh, we look forward on October the 15th to receive uh, the uh, school report cards. We'll have our college and career readiness rates, our graduation rates uh, to report with our other state assessments. And at our um, last meeting in October, we'll be able to give uh, the school accountability report. Just want to make the community aware we had our first uh, bond referendum lunch and learn uh, that was held on Friday. Uh, we have uh, two more scheduled. Uh, one uh, that will focus on items uh, within the referendum for the Irmo community on October the 9th. Uh, and then another one on October the 15th. This has been rescheduled uh, due to the storm uh, for the Chapin community. Please note that you can attend any and all of them, but these are opportunities to focus on uh, the areas uh, specifically uh, in those areas of uh, rezoning. Now, we have our uh, soliciting questions. You can go to our website, www.lakesridge5.org slash bond. Uh, you can uh, send in, register for the lunch and learns, get information, uh, but also uh, submit questions. The number one questions that we are receiving uh, have to do with uh, school funding and taxes. And uh, we have uh, put out some information uh, uh, regarding uh, tax facts. Uh, I'm a, uh, not only the superintendent, but a father of two in this district, and, uh, but also a member of an organization where we have a four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. And the number one rule of that is, first, is it the truth? And we work very hard to make sure that what we put out uh, passes that four-way test. The first uh, tax fact that we uh, are showcasing with our families is that primary homes are not taxed for school operations. Uh, a lot of the um, news clarification in 2006, Act 388 uh, ended where our 4% assessed properties actually paid for school operations. So while 6% uh, properties, 10% uh, cars, uh, trailers, uh, et cetera, are taxed for operations. The 4% properties are not. When we look at our operations, this is uh, last year's uh, operations. 
um, how our breakdown. Uh, we have identified last summer uh, by MPS $182.1 million of identified need. That was August of 23. How do you take care of this when in your general operating fund, you see that 64% comes from the state, 35 from that local operating tax, and then 1% in grants? Well, in that jar of our operating fund of 215 million, this was last year's uh, dollars, uh, what we're submitting to the auditor, 88% uh, of that are salaries and benefits. 7% of that jar are, are utilities and, and services, like the, the substitutes or lawn care. 4% um, of that are classroom supplies and materials. And 1% of that uh, goes to equipment. So the School Bond Act in 1951 allows school districts to sell bonds for four reasons, four main reasons. We can sell these bonds to fix schools, to renovate them, to construct them, to equip them. And we're allowed to borrow up to 8% of our total assessed value. 8% of our total assessed value, according to the Lexington County Auditor, is $52,689,115.76. Of that uh, allotment, we have, and I'm looking to our CFO here, 88% of that is already used currently. So again, you have a $182 million problem. Um, about 45 million of this is already used. So our goal was to uh, create, uh, to answer the question, how can you issue a referendum going over the 8% uh, without raising taxes? And basing on our borrowing capacity and our collections rate, the threshold to increase tax is about $400 million. We are asking in the 2024 referendum, 240. So to be under that threshold to increase the taxes, but over the 8% capacity. We're doing this, as you can see, both pots of money that we have. Um, there are those who have accused us and of, of having slush funds or other funds, but this is, the this is the economic picture that we have in front of us. And if addressing the identified needs um, is the target, this is outlining the, the picture that we have in front of the district. 88% of this is already used. This is the threshold to increase the debt service tax. Debt service fills this jar, uh, fills the uh, the bonds that are sold fills this jar. The debt service pays off the debt on those bonds. Operating tax fills this jar. And so as a result, uh, the threshold is 400, 400 million. I wanted to uh, take the time to share this as we talk about our tax facts. That the bond referendum will not increase the tax rate. And question will, well, if we don't have a tax, if, we, if the referendum fails, could you lower the taxes? And then this uh, chart shows what happens if the referendum passes or if it fails, then the 69 and a half mils, um, you can see how each, our, our amount of borrow or bonds that we can issue for facilities are outlined if the referendum fails or if the referendum passes. I do not see a scenario of, of lowering it unless we get rid of these numbers here. If we are making the statement that we are not going to address any facility needs, then you can make an argument to lower the, uh, the millage rate. But again, looking at the 182 million dollar need in our district. Um, that's why our recommendation, if it does not f pass, that we use as much capacity as available to address the items that we've identified as priorities. You can see our amortization schedule uh, by our financial advisor on 
what our tax um, and our debt service payout would look like with the referendum. Uh, these charts are kind of hard to uh, understand because you have your different debts that are geo bonds that have been issued. Uh, but this line here represents that tax threshold of 69 and a half mil. And same thing without the referendum. But again, uh, if we wanted to lower this line, then we would be lowering our capacity to do any work in the facilities. So I've always operated on the assumption that we wanted to fix the buildings. So it's uh, another tax fax to understand that the uh, referendum dollars are only used for infrastructure. Uh, sometimes we hear, well, they have, uh, if they're gonna use the 241, why don't they increase uh, teacher pay or, um, uh, but you cannot use this money uh, for any of the, uh, for salaries and benefits. It must go for uh, repairing schools, equipping schools, constructing schools, or renovating. And so the last uh, tax facts is that uh, this referendum is going to be put up to the citizens. Anytime you want to go over that 8% capacity, it is called a bond referendum. It must go to the citizens for approval. Also wanted to uh, point out that uh, tomorrow uh, we will have the uh, Lexington and Richland County candidate forum. Uh, that will be at Irmo Middle School. Uh, it had to, uh, the Richland County had to be rescheduled due to the storm. So both will be held uh, for all candidates for Richland and Lexington County and that will be tomorrow, Tuesday, October the 8th, 6.30 to 8 uh, at Irmo Middle School. Uh, before I go to the uh, next part of the um, superintendent's report, I wanted to pause for any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, go ahead. All right, at this time, I would like um, to uh, talk about two local board approved courses. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask our chief of academics, Ms. Tina McCausco, to come to the lectern and uh, discuss uh, our two local board approved courses. This is for presentation only. Ms. McCausco. Good evening, board chair, board members, Dr. Ross. Um, I have with me two very important people because they're the ones that do most of the work behind these two LBA courses. So I wanna make sure I give Melanie Sanford, our coordinator of social studies, and Stephen Puckett. I can't even give all the long list, but he works with PE for tonight. That's his main goal for tonight. But he works with ath athletics, our arts, our PE. He has a pretty long, long list. So um, anyway, first of all, on the, um, for tonight to discuss a little bit is the local board approved African American studies course. Um, we really wanted to ensure that we were including our local history into a course that we currently have. Um, so two of our schools currently offer this course now and we've had some teachers that have worked together to include our local identification. As of this morning, Thanks to Ms. Sanford um, really working with the State Department, we have been given some great information that we can make this course an honors course um, fairly easily. So when I say that, she's like, it's not as easy as it sounds, but we will be, there's a framework that we'll go through and we'll fill out. And what you have in front of you is bare bones of, of this curriculum, but we'll be adding to it a little bit and be able to offer the honors level for this class. And students would have the option, if they chose to take the AP exam, they could take the AP exam um, after completing this course. So we'll be coming back to you with more information for final approval. There's a framework that we have to fill out. Um, you approve that framework and then we file it away the state does not have, it does not have to go to the state for approval, but it, we keep it filed away. We actually have an audit next year, so that will be part of our audit that we'll have to um, include part of that. 
but we will be back in touch with you. Hopefully, we're looking at um, around the 1st of February, we should be able to have that back for you so that we can um, get approval and go ahead and have our students enrolled in an honors class. So I'll stand for any questions that you may have on that. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Scully? Yeah, just for clarification, did, if we did the honors course, would we also continue the current course or would it only be honors? Would they have both tracks? We do not have to have a CP and an honors course. So right now we're looking at just offering the honors course um, due to the number of students. But if we see that the need arises, we certainly could go through to a CP course. But right now we're looking at honors only. It is an elective and that's hindering some of our students from taking the course because they because of their GPA, they want to take an honors level course versus a CP level course. You think the participation would go up with the honors? Okay. Yes. Mr. Satterfield. Uh, let me ask you, and this is probably a question I should know the answer to, but I'll say it publicly anyway. If the students pass the AP exam, will that change the weighting of the course? They'll have honors waiting. It doesn't change to AP. Still be honors waiting. Right. And, okay. and again, you all have seen the memo from the State Department about that AP course, that that's not something that we're able to offer. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you, I, I want to say thank you for, for moving forward with this. I think this is a great course. I think that um, involvement of our special education students and regular education students together is a really important huge step, so I would want to, just want to say thank you for moving forward with this. Thank you. All right. So do I talk about the PE now? Yes, Is that I what am. I need to do? So with the unified PE, which Mr. Satterfield gave us a great um, walk-in into that, but with the unified PE, we currently offer a unified PE1, which is local board approved. You all have approved that. But we would like to increase that to level two, three, and four so that we can continue to increase that leadership with our regular ed, special ed student population. And um, you see some outline there of that course and how the differentiation of the, the, th the four levels would look. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer those. Any questions? I don't see any. Thank you, Ms. McCaskill. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And so uh, one of the things that uh, our emergency uh, roundtable does, led by Dr. Harris, is uh, we do multiple tabletops where um, they do different scenarios for safety and emergency preparedness. Uh, we held a, a pseudo um, a table talk with our principals uh, about lessons learned uh, regarding Hurricane Helene and emergency response. And I just wanted to share that with you all, some of the, the things that came out of that uh, uh, for your review. Uh, one of our uh, goals was to care for our students. Um, and to do that uh, in a community that faced very differing um, experiences in terms of recovery. Uh, some of our uh, families are just returning to power. Um, and then some had not lost any of it. Uh, and so um, our condition was to make sure we hit certain benchmarks. The access to the school, the conditions of the school, the staffing at the school, and then our emergency preparedness. When we talk about the access uh, to the school, um, I'm sure many of you saw images like this. This was actually sent to us by a parent. Uh, and uh, every day we run uh, 102 buses, uh, including four magnet shuttles. We travel 1,900 miles uh, with uh, 247 bus routes. The first bus leaves the uh, yard at uh, 5.15 in the morning, and the last bus gets in between 5.15, 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, I really want to take the opportunity to thank our transportation department, because they get out there before uh, those buses get out to assess uh, those roads. Uh, to reroute uh, many of the 247 bus routes took a lot of time, took a lot of planning. 
I know uh, we didn't get them all right, but they, they did a, an amazing job of, of being able to reroute the buses um, uh, so that we can do operations. We needed, and as some of you kind of ride down roads, you can see that trees have been cut back, but they're still right up against the road, um, which does present an issue to our buses with the mirrors. And, and, um, and so they were able to get out and traverse it, uh, many of them who didn't have power uh, themselves to ensure that we had our routes done and alternative routes in place. Uh, we talk about conditions at the school and the same things that um, we, we run into in our house. Uh, in our, in our, what we were dealing with in our schools. Um, if we had leaks in the building, they, they got bigger. Uh, we, we have new leaks and we have uh, property damage. Um, while we did not experience some of the damages that um, districts west and north of us have, um, uh, we had damage nonetheless. However, we had trees that just missed uh, some of our schools uh, for significant property damage. Uh, most for us was uh, power utility. Uh, we worked with uh, our, our two major partners, uh, Dominion and um, uh, Mid-Carolina, uh, working very closely uh, as they, uh, as you can know, their, their um, resources were, were stretched. Um, our biggest concern was generator support. Uh, I tried to update the board as, as much as possible as information came in uh, but when uh, the fuel runs out on, um, on the generators, um, then areas that are not supported, like our cafeteria or food storage, uh, we, we run the risk of, of losing uh, those, those stocks. Um, we did learn that uh, as we plan new facilities to uh, critical operations like food storage and medicine storage and those things uh, to, to be connected to the uh, uh, to the generators. I want to talk about staffing and, and first um, uh, many of our uh, staff members on days that were closed came in to work. Uh, some were called in to uh, help with the meal preps. Um, we over the weekend tried to get a waiver from uh, the USDA as well as um, uh, the Red Cross to do um, to feed the community, um, but uh, we were not able to obtain that waiver. However, we were able to feed students. And so uh, over that um, three-day term, we're able to give out over uh, 1,990 uh, meals for students for uh, meal, meal pickup. I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but um, there's a lot that goes into um, inclement weather and school closures. You have a lot of policies regarding e-learning, makeup time, um, work days. But one of the things I think it's important to know is that on September 30th of this year, uh, the district no longer had assets to ESSER funds. ESSER three was $15 million that we had in, in the district that we are no longer without. So things that uh, we used to have access to, um, you remember COVID leave, uh, those emergency resources are no longer with us. So we're left with what we, uh, what our current policies are. Um, if you can follow the flow chart issued by the state, uh, one of the questions is, well, Dr. Ross, why would we do e-learning on when students don't have power? And we had a tale of uh, almost two communities, some communities where parents had to go to work the students had power, uh, never lost uh, uh, power. Uh, and then we had other uh, places where uh, they were in the dark. Uh, with the e-learning, uh, we made a concession that uh, the work is not due um, up to five days of uh, when the students return. And I'm looking at Ms. Wachowski because we said that's the f uh, full day of school. So um, that five days actually starts today. It did not start Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And um, however, uh, if we look at the state law, uh, one of the lessons learned is that, you know, on, now we, that, that first day of Friday, we made the call of e-learning. If anyone could tell me what the storm was gonna do that day, please join us in our meetings. Um, 
uh, but we had no idea it would be that destructive. Um, however, I think it's important that we understand the law. Um, we must have a school calendar of 190 days, 180 of them must uh, cover nine months of instruction. We have to have at least three days for makeup days and then three days for professional development. The question was asked, well, Dr. Ross, can the governor excuse some of these days during a state of emergency? Uh, that is not reflected in the law. What the law says is that the district must designate at least three makeup days annually. We have already used two of our three makeup days. Um, as my team reminds us, we are still in the first nine weeks. Uh, we have not uh, finished hurricane season and we have not gotten through winter yet. So, um, but I think it's important to know that the board can also waive days. Uh, you have up to three days that the board, local board can waive, but that has to be after we use our three mandatory days. Some districts are in, in really tough shape and so uh, they can also make a waiver to the State Board of Education and for an additional three. And then ultimately after those six days of missed instruction, the only one who can waive is the General Assembly. Uh, but that would be beyond those six days from the local and the State uh, Board of Education waivers. So I want to um, end by uh, sharing that there was there a lot of people who uh, came together in, in this tragedy and just showed just the power of our community. Uh, you may not know, but uh, Dominion uh, really made a camp at Chapin High School and it was featured on the news because the students came up and thanked them and created uh, cheer tunnels for the linemen or um, uh, as, uh, as they were fed within our, um, within our facilities. Uh, Mid-Carolina actually, uh, Dave Wiseman went out and got cots for them um, and there were no hotels available for them. Uh, so they slept at Spring Hill High School for five days. Um, and, um, but what was nice is when they came back, uh, the students thought it, uh, thought it okay to, to tell them thank you and to write thank you notes for, for those linemen. Uh, it just shows you that, um, that when tragedy um, and hard times come, um, that the, the power of us coming together overcomes those tough times. And it makes me very proud to be uh, not only an employee here in School District 5, but a part of this community. So with that, that concludes the superintendent's report, and I stand for any questions. Do we have any questions? Ms. Huddle. Um, Dr. Ross, um, the ESSER money, I know at one point we got hot spots through the ESSER money. Does that mean those hot spots are gone now? We still have a few available. Jenny, uh, am I correct in saying hot spots? Of the actual devices, is that what you're talking well, about? Well, and the service, I guess. The service would be the. The service is probably the problem, right? Yes, sir. Okay. The hot spots, we, don't, we wouldn't have helped the last couple of days. Right. We put well, on. I said I would ask, but I was like, I couldn't even text on my phone, so a hot spot wasn't going to. Um, the other question I had, um, so I've heard from some parents who, as of two days ago, still didn't have power or internet, and they were worried about their child getting really far behind, even though they had the five days. Um, but I've also heard from teachers that say they were really giving a lot of grace there. So can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Can I follow up on that question? Because I have a question related to that and it's time sensitive because I have heard um, that we are at the end of our nine weeks and Thursday is the end of the nine weeks and that the new grading policy requires um, eight to nine grades per subject um, before the end of the nine weeks. And since we are, we've had the e-learning days and we've had the assignments that are not due yet, um, that there is concern on how to get those grades and cramming grades in the three days before the nine weeks is over. 
Um, and that, so that's kind of related to Ms. Huddle's question because we're talking about the, you know, it's, it, it's a, it was like the perfect storm, haha, about, you know, the first few weeks of school, you're getting acclimated, and then you go in, and the last part of the first nine weeks, everything was disrupted. And so the way that instruction and assignments being turned in and testing and all of that has been, you know, Sure, I impacted. understand all of that. And I know the five days, um, the end of the nine weeks has now been pushed back till Tuesday the 15th, is that right? Tuesday the 15th um, because of the days. I mean, it's just pushed things back. So the end of the nine weeks is Tuesday the 15th. We do intend for grading to kind of stop late on Friday afternoon. That gives the five days from today. Um, technically, those five days would have started Wednesday, but just because of the situation that we're in, I strongly believe that the first full day that we're back should be our first day of the five days. And so that's where today's gonna be the first day. But when you're talking about the number of grades, that is a school by school decision. That is not something that comes out from the district as to how many grades you should have in your grade book. So I'm going to assume, and I can follow up on this to assure you of this, but I'm sure that schools will be having conversation around that. Um, we won't be just throwing in grades this week just to say we've got grades. Um, the purpose of grades is for mastery purposes, not just to put a number in the grade book. So that is what we've been really trying to talk through about grading anyway. So I can follow up on that, but um, that is a school by school, department by department type decision about the number of grades in the grade book. So, but I can follow up and have some conversation about that. Any other questions, Mr. Scully? Yeah, I just wanna uh, emphasize I, that slide on the daily transportation is just, I can't, that seems like an impossible endeavor to me when you put it that way. And so I tip my hat to you guys, uh, Mr. Wiseman, I, you, heck of a job. I mean, we appreciate you and thank you for, for all that y'all do. I mean, getting up, having to assess the roads of the entire district before five o'clock in the morning is just, yeah, people don't think about it like that, but that's phenomenal. Thank you. Ms. Arnhart. Just a question going back on the, um, not being able to obtain the waiver from the USDA and Red Cross, what was the reasoning behind that? And is there any way that because of future events that may or may not arise, I mean, this Florida, I mean, this hurricane coming to Florida, and um, is there one, a way we could do that in the future? And I think for us, uh, it is where the Red Cross shelters are, are prioritized. They were gonna more prioritize the, the everything west and north of us. Um, and while ours was, was tough, what we saw in um, Oconee County, Greenville, um, those areas were tougher. They kind of uh, stage in, in different, um, they'll have one that's being used, one on call and another one on deck. And then that's how they call us. And, and in terms of, there's two waivers. So one is for shelter. So that's inviting anyone into your building. And then the second waiver is for the USDA. And so, um, when we're gonna give out this food, we're not gonna get reimbursement from it. So that cost waiver to give it to the community comes from them and I think our team were calling them on Sunday and a lot of people in federal government weren't working on Sunday. So we just made the plans to um, uh, give that out. So I, I, th I think we can get a little bit more information about um, uh, food waivers, but I know for the shelter waivers, it's, it's gonna be how they stage recovery. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Ross.